Hey everybody, I'm Greg Soule and this is Why Am I, a podcast where I talk to interesting people to try and trace a path to where they find themselves today. My guest this go around is Aaron Rabkin from Trickery Chicago. Aaron is an artist, actor, performer, door greeter, and also a magician. As he puts it, he's a uh, comedy show that is disguised as a magic show. His performance is magic, um, but it's got comedic threads woven together uh, with some of the best improvisational pieces to create a truly unforgettable experience. And hey, uh, maybe you are the uh, unpaid intern Aaron's been waiting for his whole life. (laughs) I hope you enjoy this chat with Aaron. Aaron, thank you for joining me on the Why Am I podcast. Thank you for having me, Greg. Very, very flattering that you asked me to, to join you for a conversation. Yeah, absolutely, dude. You were like so super cool. I'm, I can't immediately begin gushing. Sorry. Let me, let me roll that back just a second. I'll, I've got to, I got to pace myself, metered, measured approach to all of this. Um, so I'm going to set up a scenario. Uh, you and I are waiting for a magic show to start. You know, you, uh, you, you, uh, open the door, you let us in. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, just curiously waiting in the uh, the ante room here for the uh, thing to start. And so we're talking because you are extremely friendly uh, host that I've noticed and right. talk about me for a little while. Now it's your turn to reciprocate, Aaron. So who are you? Who is Aaron? Well, we're at my show. So um, <laughs> it's it's always interesting. Oh, gosh, I'm going to say every answer has to come with uh, some kind of a qualifier. Um, but uh, if, if we were just meeting at the show, it's always interesting. People always ask if I'm the magician. And I, uh, I'll often be like, oh, you know, they don't let me anymore. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, it's, but it's a great show, you know, you know, um, so I'm always, cause well, cause there's the surprise element that, uh, it's a true one man show. I'm the, the door greeter. And then I also, I do the show, um, amidst all of the other hats that I wear in addition. I mean, I, I truly run this whole theater myself. So, uh, so I wear all the hats. I mean, I clean the toilets. I, uh, take out the trash, I answer the phones, I respond to the emails, and I do the podcast myself. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I'm a little bit of everything. If, if, if I really had to qual- qualify it with one word, I would actually say I'm an artist, artist. first so, before I get into the other. Imagine you meet those. me at a party and we're bullshitting. How, is you, might, how would you introduce yourself there? Um, I might say I might say I'm a performer. I might say uh, an actor. I've been I've been using that one lately because it's just easy just to say I'm an actor. Hmm. Um, people can understand that. It's 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 like it's it's abstract, but at least like people know like yeah people people make a living off of acting. Like I can I can get that. But if you say like like if I said I was a magician, people would be like, but like like is that like like that's what you do? Like is that all you do? Um, so then I have to be like yeah like that. This is how I make. A- they're like, wow, like, huh, I didn't even think you could. They're like, I mean, even at my own show, after people see the show, <laughs> they'll be like, so like, what's your, like, you must have like a day job also, as if like, somehow this is not, uh, I'm not succeeding enough doing all of the <laughs> things that are already being done just to run this show. Yeah, obviously you drive Uber in between. Uh, between I'm shows, doing yeah. Uber on the side. Um, <laughs> it's delivering door dashes. It's, uh, yeah. it's a hectic lifestyle just trying to. Just trying to pay the bills, but you feel like saying actor, like has a different um, actor, uh, gravity. Well, um, which you know, funnily enough, so there, uh, I think it was the magician Robert Houdin, uh, who said that the you know it's a common saying the magician is an actor playing the role, the part of a magician, um, which is kind of true. I mean, uh, technically, if you look up a dictionary, the word magician would be somebody with supernatural powers, and there is nothing supernatural about finding cards. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm hard pressed to say if a wizard came down and gave gave me the power of card tricks, I would say take it back. Uh, you know, like can I have anything else? Flying, invisibility. <laughs> like I don't, I don't want. I'm not gonna tell anybody. Like who's gonna be like? Guess what, guys? Like I can find cards. They're like, like what do you mean? Like if you pick a card and put it back, like I'll tell you which one it is. And like okay, like neat, I guess. You know? <laughs> I could see a scenario so, where you are uh, also, in Vegas where that would work out. Bigger issue. This is, here's the real issue. If you tell someone you're a magician, uh, nine out of ten times they're going to ask you a trick. 
And that's really the, the that's the real reason I'm trying to avoid that. It's it's there's no other anything. You know, you're not going to tell somebody you're an accountant at a bar and they go, hey, man, could you like just do my taxes really quick? Just like just like really quick. Just like just like do my if somebody's like a singer, they're not going to be like, hey, like can you Adele, like, can you just like sing me a song really quick? Like, just, like really quick. <laughs> I it's have- only like, oh, you're a magician. Like you must now per- perform. I have heard people say, uh, you know, that are comedians. They say, yeah, if I tell people a comedian, they instantly say, well, tell me a joke. And it's like, yeah, ah, it's not really how it works. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's yeah, it's not. It's very different because, I mean, I, I was very much also I would also consider my, like co- comedian on my list of, um, you know, labels that I'd even put before a magician. And in the context of the show, there are uh, scenarios of which comedy ensues. But, in, you know, outside of a whole setup and a narrative and, and a story you know even story i even say i'm a storyteller but uh yeah you need to be able to have the setup and the punchline and the context and, and if someone's kind of just like you know it's just not the time and the place but it's like hey let's just keep talking and then let's see if maybe uh you know then i'll point out when you laugh and be like there you go you you know that was a freebie now i will be very <laughs> serious and you know hard laced for the rest of, of our talk I I hope you take this in the right way, but like your show. So I had the the amazing opportunity to go and see it. Um, That's how I found you, which was, I mean, it felt like kismet. Your single best magical performance I've ever seen. But it felt like your tricks were a vehicle just to carry me to the next one liner, the next joke, the next, I don't know. Whatever it is you do is just crazy like you your sense of humor like the performance i guess the performance piece everything around you know the the magic tricks to me or the illusions or however you care to refer to them was like the most amazing because i i you know i i love magic or sleight of hand or whatever it is that people do you know really anybody who's like amazingly talented at what they do i i love to watch it but um yours is probably the my favorite performance i've ever seen of anybody who calls themselves a magician just because thank you i first and foremost love to laugh i love to be like invited in on like this crazy little journey um and you just kind of open the door you welcome us in and then we're locked into the ride and it was so fun so to me i don't know it was just this this i'm not saying dichotomy but your magic, it was great, but just the overall performance for me, like the comedy and everything was just killer. Like just the way you put it all together. And I, it makes me wonder, is that like when you say like magician is the last thing you say, I was, you know, like to me, your performance, like the magic was not to say, not to say my least favorite. That's not what I meant to it was say. Was the least important perhaps? Or yeah, least- perhaps, perhaps. But it was just like, you were so funny start to finish and uh your jokes sometimes maybe like stop for a second and then oh my gosh like i don't want to give your performance away but you have a running shtick where it's like you're trying to figure something out the entire time um and i just i loved it i loved it start to finish and i was just wondering if is that some of the hesitation you have with saying like i'm a magician because that's what you bill yourself as right uh yeah so it it, it is so i i like to say it's it's a what is it? It's a comedy show disguised as a magic show. Um, and I feel like if I build, so I build it as a magic show because I, I know that that is what gets people to come. If I, if it was a comedy show, I don't think people would be nearly as interested. What makes it niche is that it's a magic show. Um, so that's kind of necessary. And then it's, it's even interesting. I get a lot of people who say, Oh my gosh, we didn't, Expects to be so funny, and so then I'm thinking. So you're telling me you came to a because it's it's BYOB, so you can bring alcohol. So I'm like, so you, so you came to a BYOB serious magic show, like we're gonna be drinking white claws and being smug about card <laughs> tricks, and that just would be such a strange. I'm like, well, we just didn't know what to expect. I'm like, that's great. You know, the lower the expectations, like the better the shot I have of of being successful uh, with the performance. And it's just calling it a calling someone a, being a magician. Um, something about that connotation, it just, and this is maybe a personal thing too, but it, it comes with a connotation. If anyone's ever seen a magician before, they then will almost, whether or not they're doing it intentionally and deliberately, 
that's what they think is a magician. Or they'll be like, oh, like David Blaine or David Copperfield or just naming or Chris Ain, you know, oh, you do like that. They just go into these tangents where it's anything else. If you're just, if you tell someone like, I am a singer and they're like, oh, like, uh, you know, uh, like, what are they going to be? Oh, like, uh. They won't come up with it. They're not going to pigeonhole you. Be like, oh, like Blake Shelton, like Gwen Stefani, like John Legend, <laughs> like like Kelly Clarks, you know, just name people off the voice. Uh, oh, like Ariana Grande. It's just there's, there's a lot of diversity within singing or dancing. You know, there's ballet, there's tap, there's jazz, there's contemporary. There's, there's all this stuff that you can do. But with magic, somehow it's like a magician is a magician is a magician. And, you know, even people will be like, oh, my gosh, like my coworker does card tricks you too would like really hit it off and i'm like does that really does that not process like <laughs> that that there's a there's a spectrum here of you know that you, i like i don't understand how how that happened and i just kind of i'm like okay you know that i guess that it just is a misunderstood and that's fine but that's kind of the uphill battle i feel by calling it magician so i'm like i will stay as far away very much so i mean i do love magic i eventually learned i used to say i hated magic it turns out i think i love something about this medium i hate magicians um, <laughs> my 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 magic mentor finally he was like he's not you don't hate magic he's like you hate magicians I'm like oh that's right that's what they're ruining it that's what's making it um <laughs> not fun so. well it's so funny like when you say that that is the exact connotation i i get in my head it's like well i think magician i think like moody and eccentric and you know like dark and mysterious and secretive what, yeah i mean it's even funny people are like oh like I, I even appreciate how how you're saying oh if you, you know do i call it tricks illusions so I, i'm like i don't call it whatever you want. like it's like who cares it's these i've been to a magic shop where they demonstrated some dinky trick with like a box that did all the work showed it to some 10 year old and the kid was like oh it's probably like the thing slides out and he's like well, you'd have to buy it to find out. I'm like, really, really man? Like, that's <laughs> how you're going to inspire the next generation is like, let them have that one. Show them something more challenging. Like, invoke interest as opposed to being like, this is a locked door and like, you'll never get behind it. Even though like, you clearly already snuck around the fence that like, <laughs> is not, the gate was open. And, you know, like, okay. They're hiding. You know, they say there's something about magicians are, they're, they're guarding a safe that's not locked. And, you know. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's funny. So I, um, every now and then I'll challenge myself to learn new things just on a whim, you know, so various weird things like, uh, juggling. So I learned to juggle all kinds of things, cool. clubs and balls, you know, and then it was like, I want to learn to pick locks. So I learned to pick locks and did that for, and then I just oh my decided, gosh, I tried to learn lock picking. It was too hard. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what you say too hard. Uh, you I know, it's, it's just like anything else it. practice, right? <laughs> Got a prat? Yeah, I think I get I get discouraged very easily. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that. So you but learned then, juggling, lock picking, and and then I did some sleight of hand. Like I thought, yeah. you know, I, I wanted it, and so um, and I still do it. I so like when I travel, you know, I'll I'll sit there like on a plane and I'll just do that because it keeps me busy. And then I've learned that like now I'm um, actually doing a little. bit. I'm kind of following your lead. I'm in software sales now. Uh, Cause I know okay. you did that for a little minute. Um, and or, well, my, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I was really, I was, I was, if software is a, a, a loose term, but yes, that's, that, that was what they wanted us to believe we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I, you know, like, um, when I'm sitting in meetings, I'm just, I'll just sit there and do that. Cause it like distracts me enough to where, cause I'm a very fidgety person by nature. And so it kind of keeps it. And so every now and then somebody will see me doing that and they'll say, do you know magic? And I'm like, no, no, I don't. But I, I can't do a little sleight of hand. Like something, okay. there's something in my brain that won't let me say, yeah, I know how to do some magic. And I think it comes down to like the way I think about magicians and stuff. It's like, no, that's not, I don't do that. I could just do a little sleight of hand every now and then. Because it's like, I don't know, it's like almost um, uh, like uh, Zen-like for me, kind of meditative, like just sitting there doing it over and over. So I don't know. Like I, I just... I kind of can commiserate a little bit, I guess, on how people, and I'm still not fully understanding why. I don't know, because it's also I'm sort of a shy person when it comes to that stuff. It's like I sort of don't want somebody to ask me to show them something because I don't necessarily want to. Uh, Interesting, just... Be because what what I have c come to sort of um, find is that at least for young kids who are shy, um, having a magic trick becomes sort of a way to 
allow them to be more um, engaging with like become suddenly outgoing like that. It, that gives them an element of, um, you know, superpower that like I have this I have this special thing and this is my chance to be, um, you know, put myself out there. And then as soon as like the magic trick is done, like they're back to being very shy and closed off. But um, that can be I'm I'm I'm, fi- I'm finding it a, a trend of sorts, like a lot of kids who maybe weren't super popular and not that I'm trying to imply anything about myself, but, uh, you know, <laughs> s- uh, perhaps there's a there's a through line here with those who who take up certain hobbies more than others. Well, is that but I'm glad uh, to what know it initially attracted? Um, you know, see, that's that. Well, yeah, I'm mean, here. I'm uh, trying to change the topic, but um, so I was going to I was going to make it back to you about uh, ah. doing doing little coins and things. Are you just like doing like coins and things in your hands or do you have a deck of cards even? A uh, deck of meeting? cards. I'm just shuffling cards. Really? Yeah. Wow. Well, because most okay. of my cards are like Zoom meetings, right? So oh, good. Okay, I'm okay, sitting okay. here on mute. You get away just, with that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but then I'll, I'll go and I'll do workshops where it's like five or six hour thing or it'll be a multi-day thing and so in between the interstitial i'm just sitting there doing that okay. just to keep me busy yeah that became uh there was a magic uh program i was in, and i i mean i guess i can i'll i can get to that in the story of of or, or, of answering your question but uh so or here i'll i'll start it from the beginning and then we get to it um this magic club well i'll get to the magic club so basically this club <laughs> uh, we'd meet once a month and, uh, you know, the, this was back when card tricks started getting really popular. And I have very strong opinions about card tricks that I'm going to try to refrain from getting into. But, no, I'd love to hear um, them. There was kind of like, I think it became a rule at some point that during certain parts of the meeting, like cards were banned. Like the kids, it just became this like almost compulsive, like like just playing with the cards. Um, and I even... I, like in the rare times I ever am around magicians, you can just see them just constantly just shuffling the cards, almost unaware of just like how distracting that must be. Like, I think if you're just in a Zoom meeting and that's just your way of passing the time, that's that doesn't matter. But like if you were at something, some proper meeting with people and you're just that guy who's just like, <laughs> and it was like, do you not even like do you, or if someone's trying to have a conversation with you, even just like a one on one, you're just like, <laughs> and you're like, I'm sorry. Like, can I? Am I not enough? Is this like, can I not? Like, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Is this just? Is this? I'm like, yes, yes. It is distracting me. <laughs> yeah. If I'm um, around people, I'll do anything that's quiet. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, I that's I remember those the fidget spinners, or there was a thing about like having like a rubber band on someone's wrist and just like sla- apparently just snapping yourself. Um, but uh, but the way that I got into magic, or the story I tell. Is uh, it was about three, uh, not three. It was probably four or five. Uh, I got a magic set from my aunt uh, on a birthday, um, just with some generic kit. It was on TV a lot in the '90s, um, and I remember just really loving watching all those magic specials. There was one particular called "World's Greatest Magic" that became like an annual event. They did five total um, in the in the '90s, and uh, I record eventually recorded all of them on VHS and, and would watch those ragged. Um, and then uh, when I was about, I think, 10, so I grew up in Los Angeles. There's a place called the Magic Castle hmm. and got to go there uh, for a brunch show. Usually it's 21 and up for all. It's a nightclub, so it's usually night shows, but they have a brunch. It used to be just Sunday. Now it's Saturday, Sunday, and that's when younger people are allowed to go. And so I got to go when I was 10, and I learned about And And that's also when someone from their junior program gets to do one of the showrooms. is a close-up room. There's a stage room. There's sort of a more medium-sized venue called the Parlor of Prestidigitation. And um, the close-up gallery, they allow to be done by one of the junior members. And so that's when I learned, they, in the announcements, they go, oh, this is someone from our, you know, young, magi- our junior program, you know, young magicians, 13 to 20 can audition and be invited to, to, you know, come here once a month. And they get to, you know, it's a sort of a workshop mentor-based program. There's lectures, or you have access to the library, you have chances to perform. And so then that just became like the light bulb. I was like, I want to, and I already just, for some reason as a kid, just really wanted to be, a magician. I don't know why that was so appealing to me. Hmm. Um, and uh, so I auditioned for that when I was 14, got in my first time. Some people don't even get in. And they'll even audition multiple times and still not get in. And so, they, and then uh, right away, kind of got an act together and then auditioned that, got accepted to, to start performing at the brunches and then eventually became the, the booker of the brunches. And, uh, and then when you turn 21, you quote unquote graduate, become an uh, alumnus and you can be a regular member who pays far more exorbitant dues than the juniors did. And, uh, but I, 
I soon after moved away from LA, so I, I have no affiliations to the Magic Castle anymore. But it was a great resource to have as a teenager. I mean, the uh, exposure and the performance. I mean, I got so much stage time. And and these were, were for real audiences. I mean, these were people who are actually coming to see professional shows. So getting to perform for people there to see real shows and there to see a magic show, uh, you know, actually there to see a magic show. Otherwise, you know, it's one of those things that you're based any other situation. You're just kind of trying to put magic into it. Like if you go, if you, I don't know how anybody would ever get stage time as a magician other than, you know, just like friends who are very supportive. Um, <laughs> Cause if you go to like an open mic, you know, they're going to be like, uh, like, I think I once did that. And it was maybe a more open, open mic. That was probably more music based than stand up. Um, but stand up comedy hates magicians. And I understand why. Um, but I, uh, I once went to one and they were like, this is like a bit different for us having a magician. I was like, yeah, that makes sense. People aren't really, there's not really. And someone asked me recently after a show, they're like, is there any sort of open mic for magicians? And I want to be like, would anybody really want to see that? Like, does anybody <laughs> want to see like super amateur night of magic tricks that like might not work? Um, Cause like you could hear a bad song and be like, Hey man, like just keep practicing. But like, if you do a bad trick, it's kind of like, Hey man, like why'd you even get on stage? <laughs> like, there's, there's a bare minimum for, I feel like a magic trick to even be acceptable. Um, but it's also very solitary craft. There's just a lot of things. Uh, I'm getting, I'm going in a lot of directions with this. But ultimately, um, you know, Magic Castle, I think, is what really pushed me into, I, you know, went to magic conventions and competitions and magic sleepaway magic camp and um, all sorts of just well, dark, dark, holes. <laughs> dark. It's a dark circle. I'm very or drain. Yeah, I'm certainly. Um, tell me, uh, or I guess for folks listening, a little bit more about the Magic Castle because I've always sort of seen that as what, like Mecca for magicians, I guess? Uh, magicians seem to think that. Um, and uh, so that, I guess <laughs> I maybe I'm just jaded because uh, I had it. I, that was at my uh, just leisure from 14 to, to 21. So it kind of was more, it was already very normal from the age. I mean, it was still really cool. I remember, I still remember when I got in, getting that letter of acceptance. I was so excited. Um, so so excited and just going and getting go go to those monthly meetings and performing there i mean it really meant something to me as a teenager um so i guess it just kind of wore off but what what happened is i think the magic castle when it started so they they started in the 60s and it was sort of this was before there was really any um any most mostly with magic i think the only way that you were going to meet other magicians would be to go to a magic shop and even being able to go to a magic shop was such a, a far off concept because not every city would have one and and you know what what a, what a, a big deal would have been to just get to go to you know and there's even people who tell me who tell stories about oh just was out running errands and just happened upon this magic shop and that's when the guy behind the counter showed me my first trick and then he was like hey you want to learn it and then i kept coming back there and that's how, how xyz <laughs> person became a magician um or if you are a magician maybe it's because you got that magic kit and then the idea like for me Getting to go to Las Vegas, there maybe still are Houdini magic shops there, but there was a, a chain of magic shops called Houdini's. And I remember every time just being like so excited, oh my gosh, this is going to be my chance to go to a magic shop. Or after the, one of the meetings at the Magic Castle, it used to be a magic shop in Hollywood called um, Hollywood Magic. And so after the meetings, we'd get to go to Hollywood Magic and that being a big deal just to get to be around it. So it's because it's very, it's such an unusual sort of hobby and craft that there's not a lot of outlets for it. So now there's, there, there are sort of these ancillary uh, groups. There's international brotherhood of magicians, IBM and society of American magicians, Sam um, that have sort of local meetings, depending on what city. And mostly it's just kind of old, old fogies who were never, you know, always amateur hobbyists, just some of them like extreme hoarder collectors. That's another tangent. There's, <laughs> there is some kind of hoarding tendency within the magician community i am 100 percent convinced of it i have my theories but i it's just very strange <laughs> that it's it's a common through line and so that's just kind of it like they'll just talk about how much magic crap they have how many rooms of their house have magic crap how many boxes of magic crap they have um they're they're you know they're i can't you know i go to these magic conventions and i just go in the dealer room and i have to buy everything i'm um, like do you like you, you gonna do anything with it they just have it apparently so but that's an outlet for it. I think that's what it is. It's just And so the Magic Castle became a way for saying, 
you know, maybe people who are a little bit more professional, perhaps, or people who who knew professionals, maybe they were some people were like really good. And also to learn to be a magician, you had to actually probably know somebody who was showing it to you. Now with the internet, I think we we take a lot for granted how different things were just like a generation ago. Hmm. Um, and I mean, there were like Di Vernon was somebody who somehow ended up at the Magic Castle. So he was a popular figure of, you know, holding court there and, um, you know, a great sleight of hand card person, which again, I can get into the whole card thing because I have a deep seated complaint that um, we've sort of lost the plot with what magic and conjuring stage conjuring really was about um, in, in it's, what it if you because because magic's actually been around since like you know, supposedly since you know cave cave days you know egyptian it's you know there's pictures of hieroglyphics of them doing magic tricks and at least like i have a, a print of a painting here that's from like 1400 or so by Hieronymus bosch called the conjurer and it's like a renaissance painting somebody at you know just doing like what looks like matt he's was would have been just like a, a street busker and you know if you look at a tarot deck tarot decks one of the cards is the magician so um the concept of a magician or even a court jester is like, you know, that is to me very, very old, which I love that I, I feel like amidst our, our crazy, crazy world, there's as strange as it sounds like job security and being a magician, apparently. <laughs> um, so that's, uh, that's kind of, I think what gave it um, legs is the uh, magic castle stars away for, Hey, there's all these magicians in LA perhaps, or just, you know, there were at the time and let's start this thing and we can all hang out here. And then, and then I think it just started as like a small thing and it kind of maybe over the seventies became more and more popular as sort of nightclubs became, you know, the hay of the day. Um, but it's, uh, it's now become sort of, it's like a trendy thing there now. And I guess it's, you know, it has a reputation and, um, cause uh, you know, I guess great, great, uh, great conversations that happened there. And so it became a thing. And now, I don't know. I just, I, I feel like something about the internet and just the way that, Anybody can anybody can be anything, but like not even be good at it or necessarily have to <laughs> prove themselves. Um, you know, like anybody can learn a card trick and be like, I'm a magician now. And you're like, ah, it's just like there was a time where you had to actually earn like you had to beg someone who maybe was to be like, please, like, what will it take? What do I have to do to like learn? They're like, well, here, if you master this, I'll give you the next step. Then okay, then you give them a little bit more and they'll go, okay. And then they would actually get good at the craft and actually have respect for it and understand it of what it is they're doing and it's found they have a foundation as opposed to now a lot of people are just learning what's hip what's new they found some video online and learn this card thing and and again i, I want to not get into this whole card thing but just assume like oh i learned this move therefore like i knew i can do this or i have this thing like i bought where like if i shake the gum package it becomes a you know it becomes cash you know oh it was gum now it's a dollar bill i'm a magician you're like okay like whatever like sure because to me, it's about the showmanship and yeah. the performance of it. And there is, if anything, I would say it's more about that than the, like, it is important that knowing the technical side, but um, most most people who would call themselves magicians or be what people think is a magician is really what I would consider a technician or even a juggler. Um, because all they're doing is just moves, techniques. Uh, they're a card mechanic at best, you know, someone who, would have you know the, the moves that they're learning and, and and drooling over are really what were popularized for for backroom card game cheating and things that should be invisible because if you got caught you'd be dead but to mm. me that's not a bragging point to be like hey you couldn't see when i got the card to the top i'm like yeah but that's not magic it's it's a that's a juggling that's a neat like hey i don't i don't believe for a second anyone thinks that because you can juggle five balls you are manipulating gravity you are just very proficient at timing and hand-eye coordination. And it's very impressive. It's incredibly impressive. And people love watching juggling and they love watching someone play, play great music on a guitar or a piano. But with magic, it's, it's really about the, what is the story that we're putting into the audience's head as far as the effect that they're experiencing and invoking some sense of wonder and invoking just a sense of like, well, I didn't see, you didn't see me do it. So like amazing, you know, you're amazed now. I'm like, that's not, it's not the same. But yet now that is what has become misconstrued as sort of like the, that's a, that makes a magician apparently. Mm. And who has no idea about the foundations of what was stage conjuring 
of the late 1800s and the 1900s and vaudeville era and these you know these tent shows and you know why houdini is such a popular name and who who was thurston who was keller like all these big names that used to travel around have all these shows and and then what led to the modern day of you know magic being on tv whether it be blackstone david copperfield doug henning penn and teller and all that has come since but now it's just I learned that I found this like neat video online and I learned to do a card trick and like now I'm a magician. I'm like, okay, like if you say so. So it sounds like you feel like there used to be kind of a rites of passage to be able to call yourself yes. a magician and now really it's any, the, anything goes. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing matters. Anything goes. Yeah. And that's definitely like I, I've been an yeah. amateur at a lot of things that I would never call myself that thing because I don't feel like. I put the time or energy or I don't know. It's like before I'm going to say I am X, Y, Z, I feel like I have to have some level of competency and, and I generally lose interest before I ever reach that point. So I would never want to call myself that thing. And I guess I have met a lot of people who don't really care. They'll just, you know, if it fits the situation, they'll say, yeah, I'm, I'm this, I'm that, I'm whatever. So I, I definitely Which feel that. I also do. I mean, I can't have an appreciation for that. If somebody is really, determined to, to I guess succeed at that like if somebody uh because I feel like there is some saying about like there was a, the, the book that I credit a lot with sort of helping me unlock creativity uh and realize that what I am what I want to be in life is an artist uh, it's a book called The Artist Way I think it's Julia Cameron um and uh it's one of those things that she, she talks about how if you want to be let's say you want to be an actor you know it's for people who are feeling like they are not getting to be what they what they feel is their that's my real calling that's my creative inner calling is I'm I want to be an actor and she's like then s just start saying you're an actor and start being an actor start you know get headshots go to acting classes you know to, the, and 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 it's sort of the idea being that if you if you pursue the quantity the quality will eventually kind of just fill itself in but if you're not at least going through the motions and believing that what you're doing is is moving towards something, it's not just gonna happen, fall out of the sky. You know, these people who are just like, yeah, I'm gonna write a book. I'm gonna write a book one day. And you're like, okay, so like, you've been saying that a while. Like, are you gonna write that book? And you're like, well, like, I'm just like, I'm still like, I'm like, just write, just write. I don't know if we can curse on this, so I'll say, yeah, just write ahead. a crummy book. I don't want to. I'll, <laughs> I'll be good. I'm. I can be a real potty mouth. Um, so I'll be, you know, just, just. Just write that crummy book and, you know, and get it out of your system. Because really, the perfect thing is never going to happen. That's, uh, it's impossible. You know, you got to do, you know, it's it's really about getting, uh-oh, work calls. Uh, hey, man, I need some of that software you got. Uh, can I get my <laughs> software fixed? Um, so that's kind of, I, 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 so I would encourage anyone who is serious about, you know, if you want to be a musician, like start musicking and, but, but, but it is like in this day of instant gratification, it's becoming harder and harder to expect anybody to actually get good at anything because of what it takes to get good at it. Like I keep thinking I want to learn another language and then I start trying and I'm instantly like, you know what? I now I'm guilty of this. Cause I'm just like, I, this is going to take me a lot of work and effort. And, uh, for that, you know, for that thing that I'm like, maybe I'll just, I've gone by on English and you know, I hate, I hate that I only know English and I barely speak it well, but, um, but I understand it. Being good at good and good at stuff is re is really hard, and it it sucks to suck. <laughs> yeah, but I think like to that to that end, like if you're not passionate about something and you just but kind of true. want exactly. it, you know, it's like good point. Yeah. Yes, if if there's enough passion there, I think then yeah, it's gonna overcome yeah the the bad parts. Um, and that's kind of uh, that's so like this. I mean, I I know I was bad. Uh, I I I've. <laughs> found some old videos of me performing and, and it's it's <laughs> irksome it's hard to watch um and i think there's something very fortunate about being a child when you're performing and i was not i was already 14 and i wasn't even like a cute 14 um but at least you're, if you're younger you can get away with stuff but like really cute kids i call it cutesy magic but you can apply it to anything whether it be a cutesy acting cutesy music cutesy dancing but a, but a child who is super cute and not you know you go to some ballet show of like a bunch of five-year-old girls and none of them are in time and they're you know just terrible but it's it's adorable so you're just like this right this is a this is a, 
fabulous. Like, like the parents are just so <laughs> thrilled and the grandparents, everyone's just like, oh my gosh, they, you know, they got through it and it was amazing. So there's a certain level that like age can almost overcome quality. Um, and you get, a, you get a great pass, huge pass. But then there comes a point where I think people are like, all right, man, like you are old enough to know better. <laughs> uh, so like you don't get that pass. But I, I guess did, fortunately I got that pass as a team. I think everybody, like I legitimately think everybody should look at stuff that they've done in the past. And I think you should cringe at it because if you don't, that means you like what you see and you're not improving. You know what I mean? Like, I think you should always be growing and doing better and bigger and, and building yourself. And if, you know, it's like, you don't want to be the same person today that you were 10 years ago. You want to be constantly growing as a human, you know? And I think that affects Absolutely. every bit of creative output you have, right? It's going to, it's going to filter into that. So yeah, I think that's, that's a good sign. Like as, as uncomfortable as it is, I think it's still important for us to look back. I did this, um, LinkedIn learning thing. So I'm an author for them. And the very first time I went into the, to the recording booth, I was terrified. Like I was just so mm. scared. And um, like I was talking really fast. I was really nervous and just, uh, just my voice was shaking. And so after like the fourth day, they said, you know, I just recorded something and they said, okay, I'm going to play back just a little bit of your very Ooh. first recording. I was like, I don't think we need to do that. And they go, yeah, we really need to do that. And I was like, please don't. And they said, you'll be fine. So I played it back. And it was horrible. Oh my God, it hurt me. And then they said, okay, now I'm going to play back 10 seconds of what you just recorded. It was like night and day. And I don't know, man, like the sense of confidence it gave me like was um, immeasurable. And so I'm a, I, that made me a firm believer of you need to kind of as painful as it is, you need to, you need to hear it. You need to see it just so you can yeah. you know, see the growth. It's important. Oh my gosh. Uh, I mean, that's why I have, I used to record myself all those performances and I would watch them back and learn from that. I've been kind of bad. I don't, I don't record myself anymore and I keep wa wanting to figure out a way to do it. I guess I'm, I guess I've kind of, um, I kind of have a different sense of what I'm, I mean, there's not as much variation anymore necessarily in what I'm doing, I suppose. So there's sort of a, um, I, a lot of what I'm doing is by feel at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, and what I feel could probably be improved upon would be, I think there's probably some blocking and staging that could use a direct divide that as, as a self-director you is impossible to, you know, if you're the performer, you're not exactly going to be able to be like, Hey man, like there's this thing you keep doing where like your hand is like this and it's just very distracting. Like maybe, you know, let's put it down. <laughs> um, so that's probably a reason I could, I could, you can be yeah, always, I mean, playing back anything, is a, I mean, or just writing something out, reading it back. Anybody who thinks like they don't need to self edit is, uh, you know, is deluding themselves. There's, you know, that's impossible. Well, I bet what you do uh, on stage is a lot like jazz where you know the notes, but they're still improvisation, right? You're, because mm -hmm. you're feeding off the crowd. You're like, you were constantly riffing off of everything that was happening. And you can only really like freely do that if you really know the material well, you know, and you can just. Exactly. Yeah. The beat. Yeah. The beats are all predetermined, but how we get between those beats is open to flow. If, if like, if, and that's what, that's what I always say is I feel like how often does the show change? And it's one of those things that I'm not about to just write and polish a whole new hour of material on a whim because I mean, some of the stuff <laughs> I've been doing for 15 years, some, you know, five, 10. So it like, it takes a while to get something polish and like there's a reason that this show probably is considered as as like good as people tell me it is is because it, the material is good like it's great material for a reason i've won i've like really i've learned it in and out even some of this material i'm sure it was great years ago and i i feel it's probably only better now because of how i how i think about it there's things that i've learned from just doing some of it so much that i finally then will be like okay, I've been doing it well anyway, but I finally understand what makes it a great trick. It's almost like I had to do it a thousand times just to be like, oh, that's why you do it this way is because that. And then that unlocks a new sort of understanding about how I can approach uh, new material because of understanding just the way that an audience thinks or the psychology of something or just under being better at misdirection or or how I use words. I mean, even like with comedy and writing, writing, 
you know, joke material, just understanding kind of my cadence and how certain words combine what word you end with on a sentence or how you use your voice can be, can invoke different ways that people um, feel about something. And it's just doing it enough, getting enough sort of response to something. You got to run the survey enough times to go, okay, when you do it this way, 90% of the time, this is the way that gets the best response. So like, let's probably, let's go with that way. And then you start doing it that way a lot. And then one time, maybe you'll have an anomaly that'll be like even a little bit better. You'll be like, ooh, here's something different. Let's try that now. So, so it's sort it's of just, a scientific method. It is the, yeah, it is the yeah. scientific method in, uh, in practice. And so, I mean, as much as like, I'm not, I'm not practicing in real time, but every show is in essence, um, you know, it's like working out. If you, if you, you know, keep doing weights or keep practicing a, you know, a cartwheel or something or juggling, it's going to get better. And so part of what I'm doing is it's not just people are like, Oh, you must practice all the time. It's like, well, you can practice a trick all you want, but until you have the actual feedback of an audience. And for me, a great portion of what I'm doing is audience based interaction. You can only do that by actually interacting with an audience. So I kind of, until it's the show, I, there's certain things that I just are unknowns. Mm. What are your What are your favorite parts of your act? You know, I would almost say like, what are your favorite tricks or portions? And I was, I'm curious, what makes them your favorite? Is it not necessarily? Is it the method is clever, or you like the way it works, or is it more what it allows you to do in your performance, or the feedback you get from the crowd? Yeah. Um, so. Uh, they're all my babies. Um, and, <laughs> and, uh, so it's really, it's, it is really hard to, um, to pick. It is hard to pick favorites. Um, or maybe style, maybe favorite style of trick or obviously you love card tricks is, is what I exactly. keep hearing. It's a through line of this whole conversation. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> yeah, if we, yeah, if we're going from bottom to top, we can put card tricks at the bottom. I despise card tricks. Um, and, only out of necessity is it in the show. I mean, like, and I even, even the way that I don't even really do any standardish card, like even the kind of one of the jokes in the show is that um, the deck is all the same card. Like I'm not even doing like a real card. Like, and what I love about that I is I feel like if you're doing, if you're doing, if you're doing real, if, you, if you're taking yourself seriously as a magician, I feel like all that happens is people are just like trying so hard to poke these holes and catch you out and make it a challenge. And this whole thing that hmm. for me is not the point. It's not a puzzle. It's, it's, it's entertainment and it's a show. And I think hopefully because I, I'm very disarming in how I'm presenting the material, hmm. I find my audiences are more inclined to not be that way and be trying to make it hard for me because I'm like, you're just making the show bad like what's the point why why intentionally try to ruin a good time that doesn't make any sense so it's like you know going going to a, a amusement park and you're almost like loosening the screws on the roller coaster and being like all right like like let's see if you can keep it safe like <laughs> okay, like why you're gonna ride it like why did you would you do that to yourself so i um but i guess okay so I mean, because yeah, each one ha each one has a place in the show. I do I do oddly find um, the um, there, there's a trick. There's the vanishing elephant trick. That's the newest trick in the show. And by new, it was added last fall. Um, but uh, <laughs> every time I do that trick, but because it's the newest trick and it's like very it's the it's very different because because I what I'm trying to do with all the new material that I'm putting in the show is I'm always trying to challenge myself to come up with something. Uh, different. Uh, I find my show when people like a strange question that I understand is people if I'm out and I do say, oh, I, you know, I do a magic show. They're like, oh, so like, is it card tricks or like, is it more? Th I'm like, it's everything because there's some magicians who really just do card tricks or some magicians who just do big, you know, illusion props. Mm -hmm. um, but in my show, I'm trying to do everything. Like there are there's there's card trick. There are there's a rope trick. There's an illusion trick. There's a mind reading trick. There's uh, you know, so it's you can appeal to there's a money trick. There's different styles that there's so much within the medium of conjuring and and magic that I'm like, why not get to play in that sandbox of everything? So and to an audience, especially, I think the more ideas that they 
experience, the more interesting, and that's part of what makes the hour go by so fast, is because they're it's just a lot of different things, and so we're always interested and engaged as opposed to if you do a card trick where I pick a card, and then you do a card trick where this time you find the aces. We didn't, and I'm like, either way, like you either found a card or you found the, I'm like, it's the same trick. They're like, no, no, it's different, and I use different methods. I'm going, maybe to you as a magician, but to the audience, they don't care. It's just, it doesn't, different methods don't mean anything to them, and different like card values don't mean anything to them. So like if you found a card, you found a card. And then for me, like if you do a rope trick where you cut the rope and you put it back together, or then like you do a rope trick where, you know, it does some other thing, like it's still just a ro- like you can only do so much of any <laughs> given material. So I'm trying to always change it up. So like that, that is something where I was really happy to come up with that, that, pre- that presentation for the, the vanishing elephant trick. And so I, I, the shows, all, and again, this kind of goes back to what we were touching on, and I found that with the the show, my show, it um, it'll be in a great place. And I'm sure what I was doing four years ago was great because I'll have people who come back now and say, "Oh, we were there three years ago. It was so great. We came back." And I'm going, "Oh my gosh!" Like I would probably now look back on what I was doing a few years back and say, "Like that." I'm sure it was great for the time, but I can only hope I've improved since then. And I've found since I added the elephant trick that the show it like kind of leveled the show up in a way. It's just something about what that trick does and where I put it in the set. It, uh, and the reaction I can tell from the audience just kind of changed. There was ever since I had added it, I always noticed it just something about the show was different. Cause it's just, it, it, it gives, it, it does this thing to the audience where they see something and what that style of trick and the, the, the shock and awe of it, as opposed to the, just the way that the set list used to run, was a little bit maybe more even keeled where that gives it like a quick pop and then we go into what it used to be. And I feel like that makes all the difference. And that's even something where then it, it taught me a lesson about, oh, hey, you know, under, like over time, I've kind of learned the ebb and flow of structuring uh, an act and, and the show and where and how I can add something and when and where I can cut, you know, dead time and this and that. Because the show somehow used to run an hour even a few years ago and I've now added three significant, four significant routines, and it still runs, you know, 60 something, you know, 63 minutes or something. And I'm like, where did, like, I've not cut anything. I've just kept adding material <laughs> and just cutting out just apparently dead air. I just used to have apparently these monologues. But that's part of it is when, you know, when you look at my show, I think a standard magician could probably do more like two hours with this set. Because they would have all this talking and this setup that nobody cares about. Just, just get to the point. And that's something that I learned <laughs> from street performing and being a busker. Because on the street, if you're not good, you don't eat. And even if somebody stops to watch you at all, they don't have to stay. And if they watch the whole show, they don't have to give any money. So it's really about just staying engaging and getting to the point. And so that kind of changed that dynamic from my Magic Castle days to being more about what is interesting about what I'm doing? What is the most interesting part of this trick? What is the big takeaway? And just just do that part. Don't do all this exposition of like, oh, you know, when I was a child and my grandfather took me aside and he said, you know what, Aaron, I think it's time for you to learn your first card trick. Would you all like to see that card trick? I'm like, just do the card trick then. Like, what is so I, you know, that's that my that but that's that's my approach and that's that's kind of what I'm doing. That's interesting. So, say you're doing a show and it's I still need uh, to answer your question, but, uh, but no, 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 we I love moved it. on. Which no, is no, good. no, we're we're gone. Uh, say you're doing a show and it's a particularly good show, right? And you know it's a good show. What is the you mean all the shows? <laughs> Absolutely, but you know yeah. sometimes yeah, some shows like, definitely hit hard hit better. Yeah, than sometimes definitely. everything is just right. So like when I'm doing a thing, like I'm talking to a person or I'm doing a presentation or whatever, like sometimes I just know when it's right and when it's good. What's the feeling that it gives you, and do you still kind of get excited by that sort of thing? Does that still hit you in a different way? Oh yeah, I mean the the goal of the show is that I should end with more energy than I started. Um, it's because uh, as much as I'm I'm out putting a lot of energy, there are more audience members, and so if they are all having a great time and sh- sh- you know shooting that energy toward me, 
I will collect that and I will when I when the show is over I will be you know in m with more energy than I started it's the shows where the audience is asleep at the wheel might as well be performing for a brick wall that I'm like oh my god so like I have to do what I'm already doing plus now make up for all the energy that you are not giving me and so I will I will get off stage and just be like Oh, like, I'm just, oh my gosh, like, ugh, just like, it just, like, I'm just like trying to like get the filth off of me. Um, so yeah, it's kind of, there's just a feeling to it. Um, and what's even weirder is like, those will be the shows where I'm like, man, those are like, just, that was a rough time. And then ever after the show, they always be like, oh my gosh, that was like, so great. We loved it so much. I'm like, did you? Like, I mean, <laughs> did, well, I want to guess that. So I've kind of gotten used to it that everybody reacts differently. Yeah. Um, I mean, part of the, the crime of what I'm doing is I am sneaking it, you know, the comedy show onto people. So some people are definitely down for that cause and some people are not. They were not coming for a comedy show. So, um, you know, so then the joke is on me that I can't fault him for not being in the mood to take in all this wordplay and whatnot and, and enjoy the, the silliness of it. So um, so that can be part of it. But it's a feeling. I mean, definitely like when it's in the, I mean, it's, you know, like you're making the jazz reference when, when something's in the pocket, as they say, it's, it's just kind of a feeling. Um, you just, yeah, it's just, yeah. you can just, you can just feel it. And it's, it's the, everybody's on the same page and I can even usually feel it before a show starts. Like I can tell by as people are seating, what kind of energy that they are coming with. And so if, if like there's a good vibe, I can already be like, all right, this is gonna be a fun show. Um, or if there's just like, there is something in the air that I'm like, oh boy, like we are going to have to like, let's see if we can just like rile them up a bit and hopefully kind of get something. Um, so, but either way, I mean, but that's kind of the thing about it, where I'm also even indulged to say I'm acting is because at the end of the day, when I come on stage, I kind of just have to put myself in the zone and I can't rely on the the whimsy of the audience to carry the show. Like somebody who's never done stand up and thinks that, oh man, I'm so funny, I could do comedy. <laughs> and then they go do comedy and they don't have any prepared remarks. And so they're just like expecting that they're just gonna start talking and it's just gonna be like the audience is just gonna laugh. Like just be like, so I mean like what's what's the deal with Uber, right? You know, when you like get in an Uber and they're waiting for someone else to basically write the joke for them. And like, no, man, like, that's the whole point. Like, you have to tell the jokes and then we will respond. It's not how in a conversation you're always funny because you're just you're you're playing off of everyone else. So mm. you don't get that. Uh, so I have my prepared remarks and I can just kind of get in the zone. And then to be so fortunate when the audience hopefully doesn't think they also have prepared remarks, but has uh, just energy to give an occasional right. occasional things that can happen on the fly that are, are fun and I can take advantage of and, and do something with and turn that into a, a scenario that is unique to that show. I mean, that's, that's what I call, I, I call it finding the fun is that every show I, my most important job is to have fun because if I'm not having fun, I cannot expect an audience to have fun. That is not fair to an audience to say that is, it is their fault that it is a bad show because like, no, it's like, that's my job. I should have, I should be having the most fun. And then, you know, invite the audience to tag along. Mm. You know, I, what you described, like you put it so perfectly and I have experienced this myself, but I never had words to, to like, like express it. And like the idea that like, sometimes I'll do like a five hour workshop from here, like over a zoom meeting and it'll be nothing but black squares oh my like, gosh. with dead silence. And you've got to like basically lead this thing for five hours with mm -hmm. zero feet. And it just, at the end of those, I feel exhausted. Like I just got, there's like yeah. nothing left in the tank, but then I'll do a workshop in front of like 20 people. Right. And I'll be riffing and I'll be making jokes and I'll be, you know, working with this guy and that guy and this girl, and, you know, just, I don't know. And at the end of those, exactly what you described. I will feel like I'll be jazzed after that. Like I'll have like all this extra energy. Like I'll be buzzing after that stuff. And it's, I'm getting to perform, getting to like interact and do all this stuff. And so, yeah, the idea that the the audience is giving you back, I guess they're like, you know, you know the old saying, they're filling your cup up. Whereas the other one, you're just, you're just draining it the entire because time. Because you don't even know if they're paying it. It's just like, yeah. I, I was very resistant to when the COVID time started. I did not pivot to virtual. Um, I mean, I've got, I, I was closed for a few months, but then I was very lucky that because of my 
the conditions of which my 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 theater exists is it's a very intimate venue already so the guidelines allowed for small gatherings and so my overhead being just me allowed for resuming shows much sooner than any other live experience started and so i just kind of you know hedged into just getting back to the real thing and then i eventually kind of had to reluctantly start doing some corporate work when things shut down and around holiday season when i would normally have holiday parties there were just ho- virtual holiday parties so i was kind of like all right i'll do it to see and it just was it's just what's the point like I, I would i would you know log out and be like did anything even happen like did could could i've just recorded one show and just been like here's the link just hit play when you're ready you know if you, <laughs> if you even so care to watch it and you but, say my theater so it is actually your theater which is this is mine pretty, it's just me that's like pretty uncommon right like most magicians kind of move around and they'll just go to a space and perform there or whatever but you actually but, have your own de- i mean because there's a certain amount of uh danger associated with that right like a lot sure, of yeah, I mean, responsibility. It's, uh, it's yeah, I mean, I I, uh, I kind of took took a took a chance. It uh, thankfully has panned out. I, I hit five years this summer, so still here despite myself and COVID. I'm still here, um, and uh, yeah. So it's kind of yeah. That's kind of the the thing about it that uh, that the, the the one stinky part is that I'm uh, like I just want to put on a show. Like that's what I want. I love is just I just want to perform. I just want to put on a show. And uh, but yeah, I also have to like make sure that the business is running properly because if the right. business isn't being if the business isn't successful then there's no performing and if the performing isn't great then there's no business so they both have to be done and it's very rare that the same per- I'm I'm playing the role of everything whereas normally there is somebody who is responsible for the venue and then there's somebody who's re- responsible for promoting and then there's somebody who's just responsible for performing and so I've had to now uh, do all of those things only because that's the only way I was going to get to do the my art the way I want to do it most the, 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 as I say, most magicians are waiting for the phone to ring so they can go do some backyard birthday party for four-year-olds or some corporate cocktail event where everyone just wants to network and you're interrupting going like, hey, you know, it looks like you have a nice conversation. How about, I don't know, like card tricks? Does that seem like a good idea? Should we do that now? <laughs> so it's like everyone's doing you a favor, you know, or they thought it was a good idea to have a, a, me come, you know, shame myself in front of four-year-olds because it's, it's, you know, it's Timmy's birthday and, you know, we think that's what you do for, for a 50 year old birthday party. I'm like, all right. So luckily I now do not have to rely on that work because that's, uh, it's very rare that you get to do something in a space. You know, that's where magic castle comes in. I think that magicians getting to perform in an environment, you know, these can be magicians who maybe back home, they're just doing these, these house calls essentially. So the idea of getting to go perform in some beautiful showroom, for people who came to see a magic show mm. and you know it feels like i'm you know i actually actually feel like a real magician you know for a change i think there would be something really special about that you know thing to perform there so i kind of started with that and then worked my way t- to house calls and street performing so i went you know i went from the top to the bottom and then <laughs> uh and then when i was ready to come back up i was like well now i want to build what you know, I always wanted my own theater. I, I I remember as you know, sketching out little pictures of what I would do, and having that luxury also affords me the ability to kind of incorporate effects that otherwise you can't really travel. Like like this show, I'm not about to pack up and haul it somewhere else. You know, schlepping this around sounds like no fun. I'm not a small moving company, so it's it's a it's a it is a luxury. I get to just leave it all here, and that people come. To me, so I don't have to go travel to you know sit in the car. You know, half of my job is just driving into the suburbs or something. You know, to go do this 50th retirement party or something, and uh, you know, make make my dough. So it's kind of a just I wanted to do art for art's sake, but also understanding the commercial necessity of you know, as much as some artists want to be like, yeah, my painting I'll be ten thousand dollars. I'm like, okay. Is anybody willing to pay ten thousand dollars? No. <laughs> okay. So then it is not worth ten thousand dollars. It is worth what somebody's willing to pay. And if they're only willing to pay five dollars, can you make a living off of selling five dollars per painting? No. Okay. So now we need to start figuring out, you know, how are we gonna do that? So it's not for everybody. So your uh, your location is in Chicago, over in Boys Town. Is that the area? Is that yes, what they call the, it? Uh, the 
the the neighborhood district formerly known as Boys Town. They uh, they 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 put out a survey because apparently it wasn't inclusive enough, even huh? though with historical context, there's a reason why it was called Boys Town. Um, and even though the bike racks still say Boys Town because they uh, just had installed them before they. Um, although what's funny is they only they only got like six thousand respondents to this survey. This was back when things were getting. I don't need to get into these conversations and make this about um, um, cultural uh, difficult uh, things, but uh, they were just kind of trying to bring it upon themselves to make it a complicated situation where there wasn't one because one person got upset. And then it turned out that even amongst the few respondents they did get to the poll, the majority still said the name is Boys Town. But they're like, no, it's we got to change it to North Halstead. So uh, they now call it North Halstead, but everybody calls it Boys Town because that's what it's called. It's you 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 can claim it's something else, but people are still going to call it Boys Town. But it's the it's the LGBT uh, little district of uh, of you know gay bars and whatnot, and uh, so that was just kind of a fluke. I landed here. I remember uh, originally I found this location. And I was like, I don't know, Magic Show in Boys Town seems like a weird. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, but uh, it actually just turned out to be really great because it's got a built in nightlife a lot of foot traffic i mean we're not super far from wrigley field either where the cubs play and uh and just a lot of people live around here like use a very sort of uh happening neighborhood in chicago people are doing stuff and uh you know there's bars restaurants so again makes it not a big ask to say hey if you come to the show there's also things to do before or after as opposed to it's at this you know warehouse in the middle of nowhere and you know you know good luck getting here and also like staying uh you know safe i suppose so uh, so it's kind of easier in that way. And uh, that that did wonders for me. When I first started, I just kind of popped open. It was more of a pop up, very simple. The space was not fleshed out the way it is now. And um, I just I used to have the window as I opened to let the light in. So I am not so uh, red and uh, overly tan because I'm not actually tan um, or that I'm in a tanning salon, perhaps um, the uh, the windows were open. And so I'd be I, this is the stage. And so I'd be performing the show. And so anybody walking by would see the show. And I originally started as just this like, hey, just come in off the street. Kind of almost I resumed my busking days where I was doing doing free shows and short like they were like 20, 25 minutes, Friday, Saturday, 9, 10, 11, 12 and 1. So I was doing shows every hour, just quick turnarounds and just trying to pump people through just to get some exposure and get people used to it and me back into performing because I hadn't been performing for a little while, um, I had given that up and I had taken up a, you know, a, a nine to five, or I believe it was like eight to six. Um, the expectation was back then. Um, so I was just kind of, I thought I was done performing. I'd given up. I really thought I was done. And then, uh, came back magic, just kind of had a way of it just kept coming back. It was like, Aaron, you so but that, that was, that was cause I was very miserable doing that. Did that about a year and a half, two years of, uh, doing the, the quote unquote, uh, Software sales are really glorified telemarketing in my case. And um, I went on this fun trip that a, a friend who does commercial photography, I got invited to do uh, like a photo shoot, a travel shoot that was so cool out in Moab, Utah. And I had the best time. And I think I even probably made more money than I did doing my my actual job. Mm. Um, granted, it was just like a, you know, it was just a one-off freelance thing. So it's not reliable, but it just kind of showed me that, you know what, I need to pursue a career path that I like, I'm not getting any younger. I want to do something I care about. And so then I, uh, had to get myself fired so I could collect unemployment and, uh, <laughs> took them like six months to get the hint. But, uh, finally that happened. And then, uh, I don't, I always wanted my own venue. I'd already kind of been percolating the idea. Even when I had that job, every time I'd see a storefront, cause Chicago kind of has a storefront theater scene, uh, in itself. Hmm. And, uh, so it kind of, every time I'd walk by a storefront, I was like, could that be like a, could I turn that into a little theater, this little performance space? And so um, just, and then, you know, as soon as I didn't have a actual stability, I was like, well, here, there you go, Aaron. Like you got, what you wanted, like now you have six months of, uh, of leeway, like, make it happen or else you're going to have to look for another job, job. And, uh, and then, you know, but at least, you know, I guess I'll know I tried or, or it's only on me that I failed. I don't know. So made, I threw, I, pulled this thing together faster than anybody. I mean, even meeting with like these, you know, free business mentors, they do through something called score through the small business association. And I remember meeting with one starting the, this was the beginning of 2017. 
and uh, you know him being like, you know, this seems like a lofty thing, but you know, <laughs> you know, see what you can do. <laughs> so I, I mean, I, I found, uh, I found this storefront in like February of February, March of 2017, and I was doing shows by July 6th, 2017, and uh, it's just kind of somehow, and like I, I mean, like I said, it's just kind of. I think things that kind of happened as they happened, hap- you know, couldn't have not, things could not have just come together any more perfect. Things that have are very much out of my control just kind of have, so, as, after a certain point, I had to learn to just lean into just like, just keep my head to the ground, be doing great work, be concerned with the show, but like some other things just kind of, just it, somehow it'll happen. Somehow the seats, somehow people will buy, find the show, buy not because I don't do any marketing. It's all word of mouth. It's all kind of just somehow people find out about it and come see it and talk about it. And so I'm just trying to put on the best show I can do. And thankfully it's, thankfully it's working out. Is that how you I don't have anything else? <laughs> is that how you've moved through life a lot? You think where like, I, I always had this problem. So like in, cause I've always had job jobs and they always say, all right, well, what do you see yourself doing in two years, three years, five years? And I would always make something up because I don't ever see myself doing anything. Like I don't, think that a far in advance and I don't know why that is I always assumed they asked those questions because most people had an answer to it and I just didn't um but do you think you just kind of live your life through kismet just uh and you sort of move from one place and then you only look so far in advance and just sort of or you because it doesn't because you said you went from Magic Castle to LA, LA to or no, well, no grew, New York. Grew up in LA, LA and yeah, LA yeah, and Magic yeah. Castle were at the same time. Then I moved yeah. to upstate New York, little town. I, I'd even again given up on show business. I I tried to make it in show business because uh, I grew up in LA doing magic stuff. And then yeah. um, my you know my parents were very supportive of of the magic uh, thing, but you know more importantly was you know you're going to go to university, you're going to get an education, and you're ah. you know going to work toward uh, you know proper career path that's because that's uh, i get it that's the that is the most reliable uh formula for success so i understand yeah. um so then i figured okay well i'll stay in la so i i uh, i really only applied to schools within basically like uh the los angeles area because i also wanted to keep having uh the magic castle at my um sort of uh having it at my use at my disposal because you can be a junior member till you're 21 so i it was a, a great, and I was only 18 when I started college. So I very fortunately got into a small liberal arts college called UCLA. And so my plan was a uh, very tiny student population, about 20,000 students. Yeah. But um, yeah. <laughs> so I went to UCLA thinking, okay, I will go to UCLA and I'll stay in LA and I'll, you know, get my education, appease my parents, and then I'll graduate in four years because I can also be pursuing all these entertainment things, whether it be, you know, filmmaking or acting or comedy and and I tried my hand at all of them nothing panned out because LA has a way of crushing all of the the showbiz dreams um and uh and I didn't even have to move there to learn that I uh, <laughs> got it right in my own backyard so when I was so then after when I was kind of in my senior year I was kind of like you know what I think I'm done with LA it has chewed me up spit me out and I just want to be done and nothing had panned out and what I was always finding with magic too was the what was who were the the most successful magicians were they were better business at business than they mm. were at, at, at performing in magic. It was those who could book gigs were the most, uh, you know, those, those were the ones who had, who had, who were that full timer. Those were the professionals because they were really good at, you know, networking or putting out, getting leads or, you know, following up or booking gigs or, you know, being the, you know, the smooth talker on the phone or the email. And I always hated that. Cause for me, I that's what I dis that's what I don't like I and and to this day still as I'm running a business is I'm not talking anybody into the show like if I I don't I I don't do any social (laughs) media I can't stand this like hype culture of of all these little these little pop-up museums that are all about just like you know hyping up like they they have influencers come take pictures with all these like trendy rooms and then hype it up like this is where like look how cool this is and then you get there and you're like oh like it's actually you know similar to if you ever see a show on TV and then you get to go visit the set much, much less cool in person. <laughs> well, everything looks better uh, through a lens. So those things are always a letdown, but it's like, haha, we already got your money. It's too late. Like, what does it matter? Like you're not, 
we're not relying on you actually telling anybody or we're a fly by night operation and we're this is a, a quick we're in town for the weekend and we're going to some other city to screw those people next so that's that's kind of my philosophy i just want to and also the thing about magic most people have, haven't even seen a great most people don't even know what a good magic show is so um that's kind of the, the the other unfortunate part is people who aren't that good can get away with it. But the Kismet side, I guess, yeah. I mean, I moved, I gave up on on magic, moved to upstate New York just to go do farming, live in a small town, and then uh, turned out this little town in Saratoga Springs uh, in the summer. They have very bustly tourism for their thoroughbred racetrack, and so all these people descend upon Saratoga, and after the horse races, they're just going up and down, and it's got like a, like a very classic Main Street. I mean, like traditional like mm, like it's perfect um and so people are just walking to you know before and after dinner to and from ice cream uh you know they just have cash and time to burn they're on vacation you know they're just waiting for their next day to go bet on horses so that i quickly realized and i had started busking in los angeles on third street and uh, san monica and so i was starting to get into that and so i was like hmm, maybe i'll resume this so i hmm. on like the very last day of racing season um, they have like it's on Labor Day week and they have kind of a thing called hats off. That's their last final like hoorah. It's the end of racing season. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do it. I went out, ended up having the best time. People loved it. And I was like, I could have been doing this the whole season. But I then became that was my thing. I started street performing. I became I mean, there's there's a ceiling to it with street performance. But I was that was how I made my living and and also reshaped my philosophy of performing. So magic kind of found a way to find me again, but in trying to pursue kind of more outside engagements and, and also running a, a one man show, I started trying to promote a one man show at a, a hotel uh, in town. Um, there's only kind of a, there's a ceiling as well to a small town work that you'll get in a, in a small town. So magic kind of, it didn't, my parents were like, okay, we've given you enough slack. Like you're, you're a couple years out of college. Like it's time you need to like get a, a, a real job. And so I was <laughs> like, okay, so I, I finally succumbed to that and did the did that route, and then it kind of came back. And I again thought I was done with the magic, but somehow it ended up. Uh, so it was meant to be that somehow life took the turns it did for me to have the life experiences that I needed to be able to, I guess, properly succeed at what it is that I now get to do. And it doesn't even necessarily mean that this is what I'll do forever. That's the other thing is like, yeah, you could ask me what is my five year plan, and like. I just hope to continue improving upon what it is that I'm doing. Hmm. Do you think busking taught you some stuff uh, that you wouldn't have learned otherwise? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, I, I tell anybody um, who wants, if, like, if you want to, if you want to learn to be entertaining, you 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 have to go f suck. Um, <laughs> now, I had the great. Uh, luck that I already had performing experience. So I had a base level of performance from my magic castle days. So that sort of, it gave me a big leg up, but, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, with, with busking, you know, you're, you're only as bad as your last show. So if you, you know, it's like you can get as many reps as you can get an audience. So, you know, do a show and if it doesn't go well, disperse that crowd and get another crowd and try something different. And it gives you the opportunity to, to work out material real fast. That's kind of a, what must be really hard about if you're a stand-up comedian. I mean, the stories I've heard about anybody who may, who makes it as a stand-up comedian, their early days are all about how many open mics are you going to tonight? Like they will talk about like all the, like the mics they're going to hit up that night in one night, they'll hit up three or four different mics because you got to run your material. If it's going to get any good, just getting up once a week, right? By the time you get up again, it's like, you know, you can you can rewrite and write and get in your head all you want, but you really need that stage time. You got to get up and you got to get the, the, the if you want to be a performer and then like you kind of brought up, not everybody who does magic tricks even necessarily wants to be a performer or should be a performer. Maybe they just are kind of interested in the behind the scenes side or the inner workings or something about the the dexterity of it or the thinking behind it the psychology and they just kind of are an aficionado who can who can know some stuff but it doesn't mean that they're necessarily not everybody who plays guitar is going to be uh jimmy hendrix it, right it doesn't have to be that way yeah i've you know i've taken to and um 
I don't necessarily know that I have an aversion to patter. I just, I'm not like a big fan <laughs> of it. You know, like, so what I've taken to do, like if I, if somebody does say, hey, can you do a thing? And I was like, well, I could do a little sleight of hand. If they say, show me, I'll say, okay. And I'll just use that as a vehicle to have a conversation with them. Like I, which I, I don't use it more regular, real. Yeah. Like I'm just talking to this person. And so it's different every single time I talk to somebody because I don't stick with it. And it also, that also becomes part of the challenge for me. Like part of the fun is now I'm like doing improv. Like I'm having to think on my feet and, and talk. And I and love, I love the challenge of that. You'll also probably find, and that's where I think with patter, pat, the put on a patter, it feel, everything feels forced. Mm. I mean, that would be the same as me taking like, you, you know, asking a comedian to tell a joke. It's out of context. It's, it's a put on, but in a, informal type performance and what you'll probably find is is if you actually kept up with these little impromptu performances over time that sort of conversational approach i bet would become more and more um sort of structured you'd probably find the more times that you do it so what starts as oh i'm just going to kind of casually approach this scenario but as you do it more you find the lines that will still feel natural. So it almost is that the patter is just that you needed to find what was the most natural thing to say in this context of this weird setup of like, hey man, show us a trick. Like just yesterday, somebody, I, I was out at brunch and, and it came up, not at my uh, discretion, but someone's like, oh, Aaron's a magician. And they're like, well, you do a trick. And so I'm like, do you have anything? I'm like, no, I don't carry around my fanny pack of you know silks and streamers <laughs> like some psycho. Um, Jeff McBride and um, so I can do but I can you know I can obviously do something and I will indulge if someone needs to see something so um, he he was already pulling out a dollar I'm like well I see you have a 20 give me the 20 and now it just becomes something that I've done probably hundreds of times but I can kind of I know how to it's part of the acting and the improv of it is you can sort of bring it like how do you make it feel natural you're not just going to go into this whole thing is like well, when I was 12, I remember my grandfather sat me down and he said, Aaron, if anyone ever pulls out a dollar, you could show them this thing. And that's what I'll show you. And it just, but for some magicians, you know, that's kind of their approach, I guess, is they need it to feel like this proper, like that's what they think of as like, I'm going to show you something that you will never believe your eye. And you're just like, what? Like, what are you? Like, where did this come from? Like, you're just like, who? Like, who? Who turned Aaron off and like this guy on? Like, what happened? So it's kind of partly, I think, is even just that's the finding your voice as as an art. Like, that's you in the moment of of if you're going to be a magician, what is your voice? And you will, if if so, you choose, or if these opportunities or I don't know if you call them opportunities so much as these events uh, outside of your control where people keep uh, asking it upon you. You it'll sort of it just it just takes time to to find. It. I mean, that's that 10,000 hours thing to hmm. for anything to become more second nature because you're yeah. still very much. And that's part of the nerve wrackingness of being new at magic and why it's, it's important to just do something very simple, um, because then you just if you if you, you what you can you can be really good at a move in your bedroom alone. But as soon as I get in front of an audience, now all of a sudden I'm, I'm like, oh, shoot, I was not prepared for how I feel and my hands are sweaty and all this stuff. And I'm now I'm just trying to mumble through the thing. Whereas if you can just focus on the performance, do the easiest thing you can possibly do and then get comfortable with performing so that now I can you know, improve upon these things, you know, properly as opposed to just like. Now I'm bad at performing and the trick's bad. Everything's bad. And now I feel bad. And now it's just like, I'm discouraged. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I definitely, I definitely fall into like when I'm doing presentations and stuff like that, you know, I have, uh, I have certain things I know I'll say at different parts. So, you know, it's like some parts are automatic, but, um, to me, I've always found like the, the real performance piece is I make it sound like it's not. And I very much felt that yeah. in your shows. It's very, I, I mean, I, I know a lot of this is practice and rehearse for you, but everything feels fresh and almost improvisational when you're doing your performance. And to me, that's like one of the like chef's kiss parts of, of what you do is that it doesn't feel practice. It doesn't feel rehearsed. Because 
the audience has never seen it. Right. For the most part, everyone is seeing it for the first time. And so I've, and there are times where I'll forget that. Like if I get too in the, the zone, which I, I do my best never to have this happen, but occasionally it can happen. I get in my head, you know, what's for lunch tomorrow. And yet I can, I mean, <laughs> and, and it, even in, within the show, I mean, I'm doing, sometimes I'll even catch myself being like, man, these mental gymnastics of like, I'm, uh, so I'm doing things with my hands. I'm saying things with my mouth. I'm also thinking about, um, you know, how is the audience taking this in? Who am I going to use for certain? Because I'm also sort of plotting ahead. Who am I going to use for different tricks? Because certain people will be better for certain things based on my read on them and where they are positioned in the room. And so I'm kind of have to pre plot that because I can't, I, I don't do the kind of show where it's like, okay, I need a volunteer who wants to come. I'm just kind of just engaging. I just kind of just get people involved and mostly from their seats. Only one person has to come on stage, which is part of, I think what makes people feel safer is they come into it. If they have any preconceptions of a magic show, the fear of, Oh my gosh, she's going to pick me. And, you know, I'm going to go sit in the back, which the back is, you know, uh, only still eight, 10 feet from the stage. So it's not <laughs> like you are, you're hit. Yes, you are so hidden. I will never see you there. But I'm trying to remind myself that this is everyone's first time. So what must it feel like for them to be engaging with this material for the first time? And then if I remember that, then I go, oh, yeah, how funny this must be or how amazing this must be to not know what's coming. And so then I get to enjoy it, too, vicariously through the audience. And so that's where I don't know if it's if it's a. Uh, just just kind of just my approach or something that is rehe- I don't know but yeah that's what's important is it's about giving get, each time I want to breathe fresh life into whether this this old tired material has seen the light of day a thousand and two times it doesn't matter because this time is the first time that we're doing it for this audience this way that you know that's how I, every show is different because every audience will that this combination of events or this you know whatever like I had, I, there was a magician I just had a conversation with a week ago who was saying he had a show on September 11th, on the September 11th. <laughs> and, you know, what that brought to, he's like, it was already booked months in advance. I don't think they were planning on, you know, what was going to happen uh, before that, that event got planned. And so he went into it and kind of was able to have a very, you, you know, still doing material he's probably already done hundreds of times, but the context gave that show very much its own light hmm. and that's kind of how i i try to see it is every show is technically different or hmm. else if it was literally i mean if it was to a t the same then yeah i mean that like i would be bored i'm not having fun then i'm not having fun and if i'm not having fun then why should the audience have fun hmm. that's yeah, yeah i mean but i'm glad it's i'm glad it's coming across that it it means a lot this is um it it it, it means a lot hearing whenever whenever I hear positive remarks about the show, it, it really does. Um, it means a lot. It keeps me going because I'm um, I can get I can get real down. I can be real critical of the work um, if I let myself. Yeah, I've, I've noticed in life uh, so many people are quick to criticize and slow to praise. And I, I have no idea why that is, because anytime people get praise, it like it makes you feel good. Right. And you would like to have more. Well, it's like, why is that such a mystery that, you know, you should probably do that for other people? I'm not sure why that is, but uh, I always try and tell people when I appreciate uh, what they do, especially when they're doing it for my entertainment. They're doing it for my benefit. It's like, you know, why wouldn't I tell you how awesome it was? Yeah. Yeah, the rule of uh, when when it was workshops, the for the junior program, Magic Castle. Uh, so someone would perform, they'd get, they could do like, I don't know, 10 minute act. They could do it as short as you want, but you'd perform some act and then we would all critique it. But the rule was positive first. Always had to start positive first. Even if it was the worst act ever, the rule was, was a good rule because then you at least give them, uh, and someday they'd be real bad. It would just be like, I like, that your shoes are red <laughs> and then just lay onto them. But at least, you know, it forced a moment of just don't, don't just don't come out the gates of like, man, this happened. And then this, cause like they, for all, you know, they thought it was going to go a lot better too. And then it didn't. So, you know, we can at least let's, and also even force ourselves to remember the, the good parts of what we just saw. And then you can lay into that. Mm. Well, you know, something else that kind of struck me about this whole conversation is I've noticed you've 
uh, mentioned multiple times how lucky you are. And I think, I think everybody, like wherever they end up, there is some element of luck. But I also know that uh, you've been working towards this goal since you were 14, right? So it's kind of like uh, preparation meets chance sometimes, right? Like you kind of make your own luck. So uh, it's for like sure, you've been working hard for a really long time to get yourself where you, because you were saying like, well, I was lucky enough to perform at the Magic Castle, but it's also you were also brave enough to go and apply and do all that stuff, right? And like put in work. And so um, it's so funny sometimes when people think, oh, that person over there is just lucky and they don't see how much behind the curtain this person, you know, like how much work they've been putting in. Man. So that's an incredible For amount sure. of work. Uh, hopefully, hopefully people um, understand just how much you've put into it. I think it's tremendous. I, 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 I know, I know many do. And, and to those who do not, I kind of, uh, I don't take it to heart. I don't take it to heart. It's kind of, you know, to those who say like, Oh, you know, so like you must also have, you know, what's your day job? Is this all you do? As if, you know, <laughs> I'm not, cause it's, it's the idea that, okay, sure. Cause they think it, they're like, Oh my gosh, you just do, you know, whether it be six, you know, I do six, seven shows a week. And they're like, Oh my gosh, that's like, Oh, and you're just like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And like, they're just like, like Thursday night, like you just like, it's just like an hour, like it's only an hour as if there's not the, all the setup that goes into it and managing the space and managing the business, the admin, the, you know, cleaning up after the show and constantly uh, stressing over not feeling creative enough that I'm writing and developing new material. Just like, this is just like, I am fully consumed at all times um, in ways that, I, I understand don't show. So it's kind of like, if it looks, I'm glad that it, at the same time, the compliment I say, if it looks that easy, then, you know, it's an insult compliment. Like to say like, wow, you just do, you know, it's so easy. You just show up, do some shows. <laughs> I'm like, you're right. It's like so easy. I'm glad it look. I'm glad I don't, you know, I'm not the, the things in my head are not like, like this is just chaos. And how am I managing this? Um, so, but so I'm, I'm glad. So everybody, so whether they're, it's a direct compliment or, and sometimes some people will be even more, um, you know, observe some, some observe the little things about the show that are the, the things I'm like, wow, like it means so much when they notice these, some little narrative detail that, uh, yeah, I, I hope there's this, you were enjoying this strobe on my face. There's a cement truck out front that's doing wheelies on me, but, um, but that's kind of cool. The little things that people, pick up on where I'm like, cause I, I mean, the layers of this show, if you asked me, like I could talk, I could talk this show. I mean, for, for hours probably about <laughs> why things happen and, and the, just the things that I've even picked up on and, and reexamining it and even things that kind of happen. And then me later realizing why that is such a great moment that just kind of happened to, to come into, to the, to the folds. But then I eventually realized what it is. So it's, um, but 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 that's cool too. So like I love geeking out about stuff. I love when there's someone who like uh, someone with an engineering mind might really appreciate the the methodology of something. Like you can there are, there are very few people, but they they exist where everyone says, oh you know how does it how do you do it you know and it's one of those things like, I don't actually care about the secrets. They're not important. They're very very lousy mysteries. So I'm not I'm not hiding anything. It's really one of those things that I I don't think anyone actually really wants to know. It's it's nobody's they just want to think about it anymore. Um, but as soon as you tell them, they're always like, oh, that's what it is. And you're like, right. It's pretty like, it's pretty lame. They're like, yeah, that, I, really, I wish you didn't tell. Like, I'd rather, I would like not knowing. I'm like, exactly. <laughs> like it was, it was better. Like, but you can't, you can't unknow it now. Like yeah. now you are stuck with that. So once you, once you know that the chef didn't wash their hands, like you're not going to eat there again. So like, but I love that restaurant. I love that fantasy restaurant until I learn the chef doesn't wash his hands and now I can't eat there anymore and I can't like tell any, you know, send anyone else there in good heart but um, but some people you can tell them the trick and they'll be like oh that is so oh my god and that's when it almost feels better Tell like it's almost exciting yeah. to tell them because you're like right isn't that like so cool but if they're not going to react like that what's the point in telling them you know why you know just be you know there's a moment where the, their fruit appears under the cups and you just feel like I've seen people literally picking up this table and looking under it like there are these trap doors or secret <laughs> pneumatics and i'm like that would be so cool but it's all the secret i just put the fruit under the cups when you're not looking you're like i didn't see it. i'm like that's what made it magic so you know doesn't yeah. 
<laughs> knowing doesn't really make a difference. It does it. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I've had people ask me that stuff before and it's, and I say something similar. It's like, are you sure you want to know? Because it's going to ruin this forever. As long as you're okay with that, I like, can totally happy to tell you, but yeah, it's like also, I think you mentioned earlier, YouTube, everything's on YouTube now. So everything's out there. I mean, if you if, really yeah, want to like know if, if you're too lazy to even hit Google search for like, how do you do that? Now, some of this, I will say, I mean, like that's oh, ideally the goal of what I'm doing. Uh, a lot of this material should not be readily available on the, on the, the internet. So fortunately I would say probably 90% of the stuff you're not just going to be able to Google search and find the answer to, but, um, but, but yeah, I mean, it, it, that's kind of how it is, is everything that I've learned is technically out there. It's not like I had to go uh, to some t high up mountaintop and beg the, the guru to, you know, take me under his wing. And I had to, you know, sweep the floors for 10 years before he finally, you know, was like, okay, you have earned it today it was your day. We will take you in the back room. And I, you know, it's, it's really just kind of the, it, it naturally happens by, you know, there, there's books, there's tapes, you know, could be that you have somebody who you, you talk to and you swap ideas, you know, peers and mentors and, and things, but it's really ultimately just kind of a, how, how high up the mountain did I want to climb? And the more that I know and, and took in, I kind of have a better sense. And, and as you engage with it more and very fortunate with the internet, that there were sort of these chat rooms, like when I, when I was like 12, 13, kind of the internet was starting to become a thing that there was some chat boards for magic that were great resources that enabled me to have more magicians who, who just wanted to talk shop and they, they kind of wanted to recommend these books and these things. And so I got that a lot of fundamentals and foundational hmm. kind of knowledge base that has now enabled me to, 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 to be at the level that I am because I have that knowledge base. And so when people are, they ask me, they're like, Oh, so like, if you saw a magician, do you know how it's done? I'm like, I, yeah, there's a you know very high likelihood I do just by nature of there's only so many things to do it, and so now I can't I can't watch something without you know if somebody was a big time musician who was like really into I guess like you know music theory I'm sure like every time they hear a chord they're like oh A major seven B flat minor you know that's probably just naturally just goes through their head it just happens and so I'm watching a show going oh he's putting you know his hand in his pocket like. Why are you putting your hand in your pot? Oh, right. You're doing that. You're setting us up for this. Like, interesting that you asked him this question. It seems like it's going in this direction. And it just becomes predictable because there's only so many. So then that's kind of the, what makes a great magic trick is the, the more unpredictable it is. And that should apply whether you're a magician or an audience member. Same with comedy. That's what makes good joke is they don't see the punchline coming. That's what makes something funny. It's the surprise element of dun 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 da 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 Oh man, that was good. Same with magic is you're expecting this and then all of a sudden you take one more step and you go up oh, the, there was no rug there. The floor is out from under me. <laughs> and that's that feeling. So, and same with the, and then the same, you could say applies to sort of like a haunted house, a, a good scare is the element of surprise. Now each one sort of triggers different, I think parts of the same emotional reaction, magic and comedy being more, I think um, like excite, like magic can be like, Oh, you know, the gasp of, of, of like, Oh my God. And then, you know, but either way, I think it gets the, it gives that heart a little pump you know good laughter you know you're just like oh like it feels good to laugh feels good to to gasp maybe being scared some people you know it's a different kind of a adrenaline rush in the moment maybe it's like let me just catch my breath i'm too surprised but um <laughs> it's you know it's hitting that same nerve I, I feel like that element of the unexpected yeah i was thinking about it and i think you kind of alluded to it a little bit is that there used to be sort of like a mentorship mentality to magic right like a lot of this stuff was and kind of everything locked. apprenticeship yeah in general yeah and so i was thinking about it that that piece where the secrets are locked away that's kind of not anymore now that the internet's here you can go and you could buy any trick right like most people will put their methods out and stuff like that or you could just find ways of doing it and i was thinking while you can still learn the mechanics of it the performance piece i don't see like I don't see that being, I don't see you being able to just read a book and Correct. figure that out. That to me, that feels like something that, especially wisdom, you know, it's like the wisdom to, so there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom, right? Knowledge is what? Knowing that uh, a tomato is a fruit and wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad sort of thing, you know? So 
like I your just years heard that recently. <laughs> I don't know what I heard that on, but yeah. Yeah, but exactly. your years of like performing at the castle, busking, you know, doing the nine to five, hating the hell out of it. And then, you know, so it's like, and then learning to build, uh, build an audience, learning to control an audience, learning to, you know, put a good joke in here, move these things. So like, that's all the intangibles that you either have to learn the hard way or you have a life hack and you have somebody kind of help mentor you. Have you ever sort of thought about doing that? Has ever crossed your mind to like mentor somebody? Has anybody ever approached you? Um, I mean, I would, I would be, I mean, people, sometimes people will ask me, they're like, oh, do you teach magic? And I will sort of, it's one of those things that I, I'm, ha- I don't, I would, it's not like I'm, I like that, that is not how I make my living is by teaching. Like people think they're a genius, like you should do like a magic camp. I'm like, if you want to program it, like I'll do the, I'll show up for the teaching, but I, that's not, <laughs> that, that you're just pulling me away from what matters most is I just want to perform and better myself as, as a performance artist. Um, now I, I'm, I love, um, seeing others succeed and I'd rather there be people doing better work than bad work, whether it be, I mean, I'm happy. I would even love to be, I would love to be a theater director, even just direct general performance. But, um, the idea of mentoring, I suppose nobody, not enough people really reached out to me and most people who are reaching out about learning magic. I think that they're thinking there's just like this course and it'll just like be like, do this, 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 and now you know magic. Like I, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of almost have to break the news and be like, okay, here is, here's like a resource. I'm like, go learn that. Like, here's some videos of like people that I think were decent enough to teach this free tutorial. Learn that. Go perform. Like I've seen, there was somebody once after a show who did this very basic card force, and a thing where like you can like put like ash on your arm, like you put you write in soap out before the thing and. So it's, it's invisible, but then you take ash and you rub it on it and then it'll say whatever you wrote. So you force the card and then you, and then, and then you put ashes on your arm, but he made this like 12 minute thing out of it, put on a phony Australian accent. And it was so entertaining, <laughs> not a magician at all, but he knew this one trick. And to me, that's what I, that's, that's what I try, I try to stress is just, it's about the, now that's again, that goes back to the, not everybody wants to be a performer, but if you want to be a great performing magician or I, 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 then it's really about the be a performer, put yourself in these, those situations that you can convince the audience that something that is actually quite mundane is extraordinary and interesting and worth giving a uh, time to. So um, I don't really get those, those chances too often. And most people who think that, that they're, they're going to learn something, end up realizing quickly. They're like, Oh, this is actually more work than it is. And I'm wasting, and they're almost like they are, they're almost, becoming apologetic they're like actually i'm realizing i'm probably wasting your time i'm like you're i'm like i'm happy to do this but like i'm not just gonna hold your hand through it i'm gonna show you some stuff you go take that with you do what you will tell me what resonates with you and then rarely most of the time they just kind of go like you know what i actually think i enjoyed more uh being in it gave me a better appreciation and i think that's where i will live with it so it would have to be somebody who probably already had had a little bit of a a solo path of wanting to learn, let's say magic and becoming a magician. And then, you know, finding me, like I had some kid uh, at a, she was like 14, I think. And he had just been at the magic camp. I had gone to uh, like 18 years. No, no. So 16 years ago. I don't know. Uh, 16, 15. And so he just happened to go to Tana's magic camp and he's 14. And so they came to the show. I think he was visiting from, I don't know, maybe, maybe Houston, I think. Um, I was going to say, I was going to say in your power, I think you're in Austin. I'm between Austin and Houston, kind of right okay, in the middle. Okay, so maybe, you know what, maybe he's your neighbor. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's one of those things I, I was talking to him after, and that was kind of the, the, that was the extent of which I can, I can give you my, my input, but, um, I, and then I, I give it, I give the option. I'm like, hey, if you ever want to reach out, if you have questions, feel free. But I guess I'm not really at the point yet. What, what would what would be required because a proper apprenticeship would be essentially what I hope makes a comeback. Um, but it's really tough in these times of just like, what is the value of labor? I mean, this idea of, uh, you know, I, I 100% agree that we need some sort of livable wage. But the problem is that when that livable wage makes the business untenable, because I, you know, at what point is it like, you know, I'm not going to hire somebody for $20 an hour 
as their first job. Like I, like I feel like in a, a high school or like maybe their first job, like just getting experience at what for free. I did. I can think of all the free work that I did as a teenager to just get any job. I went. I volunteered to a a profit for profit restaurant to just get time to go harass their patrons, go table to table. <laughs> and and there are magicians who get paid to do this. But I was at the point where I was like, I just want the gig. So I was like, I'll do it for free and I'll work for tips. So I would just, and for a meal or something. And I would just go like for two hours on Fridays and Saturdays, to this restaurant. Uh, and I would go around and, and that just kind of first, that taught me a lot about just like the part of it, like with, with, with busking. And this is more of like a strolling table hopping thing. And I, I don't fortunately do, pursue walk around work anymore but it gives you a, it gives you a skin of a uh, thick skin to go up to a table and go hey my name's Aaron I'm going around you know I'm the house magician I'm going around showing uh you know some entertainment before your meal to be something of it and just getting just getting that initial yes you know that teaches you just like the approach how do you engage an audience because mm -hmm. you're gonna probably who otherwise no one's you're not just gonna be like hey you want to see magic like what who is this like you're not our server like what the heck is going on like well, this is weird so you just like kind of getting that and and if that one didn't go well move on to the next table or even just kind of learning about how to read a room you know looking at tables and going okay they're in the middle of a great conversation don't go interrupt that that's a bad idea you know they're, and if you do and even if they say yes they're gonna have a bad time they're not gonna enjoy what you're doing they're just doing you a favor and so that's just kind of uh, but I, that was free work I, and that gave me exposure that gave me a jumping board you know interning at a theater learning about how to run you know, the equipment or working in the box office, it's all these things that I, I feel like the, the, someone like I'm at the point people are like, when are you going to hire like a real Steve? I'd be like, I will hire a real Steve when somebody grovels, you know, begs, <laughs> basically like, I, you know, like, this is like, I have to, I have to work for you. I need to be, I need to be, I need to be here. I will be here. I will do whatever it takes. I will come to every single show. I will be the most reliable person because I don't need someone who I'm paying $20 an hour to maybe show up and hopefully do a good job, you know, that I have to also train them to do. And then I could have just done it myself and known that I will be here for every show. And as soon as they, they're like, Hey, you know what? I actually have to go to my friend's birthday party this Saturday night. I can't come to the show. And I'm like, okay, so why did I even hire you? If I'm just going to do the show myself and I should just design the show to do them all myself anyway. So that's kind of, that's kind of what's keeping me. So I guess I'm still, I'm still too young, I, I hope, to to be a proper – it's going to have to be one of those things where maybe somebody will be my age, I don't know, when I was like young 20s and would have wanted to find a place like – would have been more willing to to grind at something like this to just get that experience and exposure. Hmm. So I'm open to it. I'm just waiting for the day. I'll, I'll know it when it comes, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, man. Like, I get it. But what what really kind of intrigues me is though so I'm in a very technical field, right? And like my job is to like I'm a salesperson, so I'm presenting to people all the time, and I have a lot of um, folks that I work with that present in the same technical field, and a lot of them are like robots. You know, it's like they've been mm. technical guys their entire lives, and so. Uh, I fortunately have kind of a life hack of doing like this thing right here where I get to like talk and perform and I kind of learn those skills and like I had uh, done that like LinkedIn learning. They taught me to like, you know, um, use my voice. They, you know, frenergize it is what they would say because, uh, Friend, you know, you people say frenergize, frenergize, yeah, friendly energy. Because like, okay. they would say, well, you know, it's like not everybody's going to be able to see your face. So you have to right. convey all of your emotion with your voice, right? And so like when I'm talking to people, and I'm turning I, it on, like I naturally do that, right? But like not everybody has I find has myself on the phone, I I smile at the end of sentences, whether or not it comes across, but I'm just like trying to feel like I'm I'm exu I'm sending that that frenergy yeah. through the phone. Yeah. And I'll gesticulate. Like I'll be in the sound booth by myself recording something and I'll be using my hands like I'm an Italian guy. You know, because it's just yeah. something like it you know, like this whole body experience, it like comes out in your voice, right? And so uh, I wish there was like a life hack <laughs> to, or like a class or like something that some of my cohorts could go to. I mean, shit, I could even, I, I could benefit from it myself, you know, to like teach people to like 
distill down like i don't need to know how to do magic tricks right or mm-hmm. xyz it's like most people need to learn to just be comfortable in front of a crowd but how do you do that without having a reason to be in front of a crowd you know like if you're doing stand up or you're doing magic or something like that i think so many people could benefit in their lives from just being able to harness kind of that energy that uh sometimes that fearlessness to just you know talk to strangers or i i i hate myself for for giving this advice but i think <laughs> i think i think that it's a good idea that everyone should take an improv class i really believe that anybody even those who have no interest in being on stage can benefit from just like a very beginner improv class um because it puts it puts one into in a very uncomfortable scenario of of like you're just you like you feel like a fool and so it forces one to just kind of become comfortable with feeling like a fool and be kind of being more present and in the moment and then apply that you can apply that lesson to anything uh, any everyday life scenario but um the only downside of that is that those who are taking the first level improv class, um, a lot of them will be from like, they'll have these big improv backgrounds that they want to brag about. I did improv in high school and college. I was like captain of my team and all this stuff. And then all of a sudden they're, they're foisted. Like if you want to do some second city program, you know, you got to start from the beginning, do all the classes. Sometimes I think you can test out of it, but a lot of people like you kind of have to go through the whole thing. So like you'll be in a first, first level class with people who think that they're already amazing at improv and it's beneath them. And then people who probably have no business being there. So I, I guess there should needs to be a way for it's like improv for non improvisers, level one beginning improv, because um, you'll because then you as you pr- can continue through. And I don't like I am not a fan of of improv, but uh, <laughs> but I did I've done a lot of improvisation and it is a, it is a very nifty um, tool. I just don't like improv for improv's sake, where like some of them get a little too artsy about it. Like they like some improvisers can get real. Um, they can get real, uh, uh, yeah, they can get real in, in, culty about it, I guess. It's not the best way to put it, but, like, it's just, it's too much of, like, an insight. Like, it's too much of a insider thing. Same with magicians. I don't want to hang out with magicians. Um, you know, <laughs> the joke I say, you know, they're just sitting around in a circle jerking off with a deck of cards. And <laughs> it's kind of the same with, like, improvisers who are just, like, you know, the, for me, I'm, like, I always feel like I can find I can find the joke. I can find the funny real quick. But the improv was like, but like, what is the theme of the scene? Like, what is your character? Like, you keep going. And some people don't understand how to listen. So, like, it is important. Like, it forces listening and, like, reacting properly. Because some people will do what they would call steamrolling. So, they're going to come in the scene. They already have an idea. Hmm. And this is the way that I'm doing it. And so, someone will present something. But, like, this person already had an idea. And so now it just doesn't make sense. And it's just bad. Um, and some people will also put bad ideas out there and you will have to unfortunately um, deal with that and just be like, man, I don't. And then you just learn like, I'm never doing a scene with that person. Like sounds no like scenes. you're uh, triggering some of your PTSD there. I definitely have, have improv PTSD. Thankfully it is far enough behind me. And, um, but I mean, I, it was, that was what I did when I first moved to Chicago and I was just doing, I was just doing, you know, the software sales, I was like, okay, I'll, that'll be my, like my outlet. I will take it like, and Chicago has a big improv scene. So, um, so I signed up and that was like, also like a good way to meet people. I was like, I need to meet. Cause I, I was new to the city. I only had a couple friends who I knew prior to Chicago. I was like, that'll be a way to expand my, I guess, um, social network by taking an improv class. And so I did like, I think I took like seven, I did the whole IO beginner series. There's, there's, I think technically it's it's like six A and six B, so you end up doing seven, um, but uh, they they there's six levels, and at, finally at six B you get to put on a show. You work all that time just to put a, put on a, a show that you paid for. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're happy to take all your money for all those classes, but um, but it was yeah, but it also kind of it weeds people out as you go on, and then there's sometimes the person where you're like really you signed up for like the next level like you didn't think that the last one should have been your last class um so you know but hey if they you know they love it apparently they love it so i'm like that's good too you know but it's a, it's a good skill i think it teaches listening um at least it's supposed to and also just like feeling feeling comfortable with a uncomfortable 
scenario. Hmm. Fake it till you make it. I can dig it, man. All right, Aaron, I tell you what, I've eaten way too much of your time. I've actually gone over what I said I would. And oh, no. I, I would apologize for that. That's I try to be no, no, super no, respectful fine. of time. But um, oh, no, I'm being I'm being disrespectful of your time. No, 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 no. You yeah. were so kind to uh, oh, my pleasure. to accept no. it. Say yes, and I'm I really a chatty Kathy, so <laughs> I I can talk. That's my that's my. I mean, that's what I do for a living. I talk for a living, um, and also just I gesticulate with uh, with strange props and whatnot. Um, but I, well, I I I guess I'm not. Some people may be just going to listen to this. I always forget that. Um, even though you can see me, not yeah. everyone can see me. I love a good uh, podcast where they're like, for those who are not watching the stream, this is what's currently, you know, nothing makes for great radio, like talking <laughs> about what's happening in the studio. They're going, oh my gosh, he's now on the floor and <laughs> he's rubbing himself with peanut butter and they're going to let the dogs on him. Oh my gosh, the dog is licking it all up. <laughs> Yeah, I like uh, for those of you at home. Who, for those of you who are on the car, just listening to this, uh, that was what just happened here. Absolutely, uh, what just happened. Yeah, <laughs> this is wild over there. <laughs> All right, man. Well, uh, right here towards the end, I like to say, hey, if there is any way you'd like people to interact with you, like a website or social or any of that stuff, how would you how would you have them do that? Everything is Trickery Chicago. Uh, the website is trickerychicago.com. The Instagram that I post maybe three times a year on is Trickery Chicago. <laughs> um, the Venmo is Trickery Chicago. The uh, <laughs> No, uh, yeah, it's all Trickery. The, the, the business is, is called Trickery, um, and it's in Chicago. And uh, that's kind of the – that's about it. Yeah, I'm not uh, – I, I don't I, – I, yeah, I don't have a whole – I don't have a book to, to promote. There's nothing to buy. Uh there's just a magnet for a dollar if you come to the show. That's my big, that's my, that's my shameless plug. Magnet, magnets for a dollar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, it shows Thursday through Sunday, right? Every Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, the tickets you can find through the website, trickerychicago.com. Redirects you to Eventbrite, which is the current online box office. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm just here doing my thing. Uh, so yeah, if anyone's ever in Chicago, it'll be a treat. And, uh, I don't really post much on, like I said, I don't really post much online. I don't post many videos. I feel like you should put stuff on YouTube and this and that. I just, I just don't feel like what I do is all about the, the live. I, I, nothing really translates well to, to a video format for me, I guess. It, it never is stuck for me. So hmm. alas, it I'm was an amazing experience. You're an amazing, uh, Thank performer. You performer i would say yeah yeah that, that to me that feels like it encompasses everything so well because you do so many things it's very multi uh multi and uh i hope uh i hope i get to see you again 